Rashid. Thanks you. Uh, thank you. Well, it's a great pleasure to uh, to uh, give this talk, and that's, thanks for the invitation. Um, and so today I'm going to talk about higher order fluctuations in dense uh, random graph models. We've just put the, uh, uh, the the preprint on archive a few days ago. This is joint work with uh, Goshan Ka, who's currently my postdoc in Singapore. So let me quick give you a quick overview over the uh, over the, the talk. I want to um, first talk a little bit about what dense graph limit theory is. Just a very short introduction. Give you sort of the problem statement, what we're interested in then sort of the, an executive summary of our results so that uh, um, so they get sort of the high level view of, 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 of these results. Then I go in maybe a little bit uh, into more detail uh, and talk a little bit more about the specific approximation theorem that we're using uh, and then followed by some discussion about this particular, um, particularly um, statistical applications of, of, this, uh, of these um, uh, of, the, of the results. And if I have time, I will go into the uh, more details of the orthogonal decomposition that is underlying this sort of um, approximation result. Although I, I doubt I will have time, but, but let's see how it goes. Um, so why, all right, dense graph limit theory was sort of initiated by Lovas and uh, Segedi in 2006. And uh, what do we mean by uh, a dense graph um, sequence that's essentially a, a sequence of graphs here that where the ed, number of edges in the graph scale like the number of vertices is a vertices squared. So this is, these are dense in the sense there are a lot of edges. And while these graphs are not realistic because most uh, uh, real networks tend to be not that dense, um, uh, so, so, so the practical applications are limited, um, but it's sort of mathematically the theory is the, is, is the most elegant uh, in this dense uh, regime, and so that's sort of a good good starting point to see how uh, what sort of uh, to to develop a theory uh, that I will talk about later. And of course, we can without lots of general, much generality, we just assume that G n has n vertices just to make uh, life easy. Now, um, one way to analyze these de dense graph sequences is through uh, their subgraph, so-called subgraph densities. There are other ways to analyze them, and they're all they're sort of in this dense world. They are equivalent, but uh, the one we're interested in uh, for this talk are the subgraph densities. So let's assume we have a dense graph sequence um, and we fix a finite simple graph on k vertices. I should say that all graphs we consider here are uh, finite, um, simple, that means no uh, loops and no multiple edges and undirected as well. So uh, let's have a finite uh, graph uh, on k vertices fixed and so we define the subgraph density of f in gn to be uh, denoted by the symbol t sub f of gn and that's defined as the number of homomorphisms from f into gn and then we divide by the maximal possible number of such homomorphisms that we could potentially have. This can be reached if this is just a complete graph. In that case, we actually get n to the k. Now, what do I mean by homomorphism? I mean a mapping of the vertices of f into the vertices of g. Typically, of course, n is large and k is small, so there will be n to the k such mappings, and we, they don't have to be injective at this point. And by, um, by homomorphism, I mean edge goes to edge, but we don't care about non-edges going to non-edges. So we're not looking at induced subgraphs or motifs, as they're sometimes called. We're looking at just um, homomorphism, so just subgraph counts. So by this normalization, this, this number here will end up between 0 and 1, and that's the reason why we call it a density. Now, this is sort of a, a combina more of sort of a combinatorial point of view, I'd say. And so for this theory, it's beneficial to switch to a more analytic point of view. And in order to do that, it's, it's best to um, represent graphs um, instead of as combinatorial objects, we represent them as functions. And the way to do that is we define, we're going to find a function kappa sub n, that is the lifts on the unit, um, on the unit square, and maps into zero one interval and constructed as follows. So you have, you, you start with your graph here, you write down the adjacency matrix, one means edge, zero means non-edge, and you can see obviously it's symmetric because we're looking at undirected graphs. And then you just write down, the write this down as a function where uh, black here stands for one and white stands for zero. And just to clear, be clear here, this is, this is one over n and this, this whole thing here is uh, just a zero one interval. So that's the sort of way we embed um, this adjacent matrix into 
into uh, represented as such a function. Of course, you have to switch this to turn into the usual coordinate system. So here's our uh, function that sort of represents the adjacency matrix. Um, there, of course, subtleties about this, but but that's not uh, that shall not be uh, bothering us uh, for for this talk. Now, it'll be beneficial or necessary to not just allow values zero and one here, but allow any value between zero and one, uh, any real numbers between zero and one. And so any such function will be called a graphon. So a graphon is just a symmetric function from the unit interval into zero one, into the zero one interval. Um, now, what we need to do first is um, sort of uh, re-express our subgraph density T sub f g n, which we have defined in terms of homomorphisms, and um, in terms of this, we want to represent it with using this this graphon induced by this uh, graph g n. And the way to do that is uh, we write it down as an integral over these products. Now, what does this product do? It's just going through all the edges. So this just means i is connected to f, i is connected to j in this graph f, and then we pick the corresponding coordinates, and then we go through all. Um, through the whole space zero one. I mean, if you think about this zero one here, this represents this <coughs> interval zero one, and by going integrating across zero one here, at least one coordinate is just going through all um, sort of vertices um, of the graph, and then we do that multiple times, some uh, k times here. Then you get sort of a, a, a if you think about this, it's sort of a, a, um, a sum over all uh, combinations <coughs> of vertices, yeah. and this will this product here is just one if if all of the edges are present in that particular part of the graph g n. So that's, that'll be one, otherwise it'll be zero. Okay, so now the beauty of this is that uh, we're not restricted that this kappa has takes values zero and one, we can just plug in any function here, so any general graph on, we can plug it into this formula and get a value. And so that's the definition of the subgraph density for graph ons is just this. So you give me a graph on a function from unit in a squared to zero one and I can calculate this uh, subgraph density, which is just an analytic sort of object now, rather than a combinatorial object. Um, all right, and so the, what's the cornerstone theorem of this uh, dense graph limit theorem? That's what Lovas and Sekedi uh, in 2006 proved. If I give you a dense graph sequence, now this, there's no randomness here at this point. It's just, this is a, uh, deterministic. It's a sequence in this, space of graphs or you can embed it into the space of these uh into the space of these sort of functions if i give you such a uh, sequence and the sequence is such that for every f these subgraph densities converge to a number that of course depends on f then there exists a graph on such that the limits can be expressed as subgraph densities with respect to this graph on so that sort of that sort of shows that this uh, is a sort of complete metric space, or it is even compact in this case. So that's a rather nice way of uh, expressing graph limits. And so we can think of kappa being the limit of this dense graph sequence. Now let's have a specific example that has randomness in it. Now of course the graphs are random, and so the the uh, the corresponding graph one that you get is random as well, and the subgraph densities from that graph here, that those objects will be random, right? Because we have underlying randomness. So let's assume we have a graph Gn, that is an edge journey random graph, that means n vertices, and all the edges are independent, uh, present with probability p and not present with probability one minus p. Then number one, that'll give you almost surely a dense graph sequence. So now, again, we're on a probability space, so we have to these convergence now turn into almost sure convergence. And almost surely these random quantities now converge to these quantities over here, which are now deterministic. Um, we can think of this Eddie random graph to converge to a graph form that is just constant P, right? So how can we see that? Well, we constant, if kappa is just P, let's quickly go back and look at this expression here. Of course, if this is P, no matter what Xi and Xj are, then of course what I get here is the product, uh, the p-fold product, um, a product of p as many times as we have edges in f, and so that's p to the number of edges. And then of course this integral is just uh, one because it's the unit, uh, the k-dimensional unit cube. Okay. Now what you, the main point here is that as you can see, 
the limit is deterministic, right? That, so this is a sort of a first, approx first, first order approximation theory. And if you will, it's sort of the law of large numbers or equivalent to the law of large numbers for sums of random variables. It's a really, it gives you the first order um, behavior of these graphs. There's no, uh, all the randomness of the edges has sort of disappeared and we end up with this quantity on there. I mean, this, this graph one is just deterministic. Um, you can generalize this to what one would call in homogeneous edge or any random graph or a version of that. And I would, this is sort of the workhorse of uh, dense graph limit theorem and it's constructed as follows. So I'll give you a general graph on kappa and the way you generate the finite graph from that is you sample um, sort of the vertex labels, uh, u1 up to un, so you have n vertices, so each of them has a label and these labels are iid uniform on zero one on this interval and then you connect i and j vertices i and j with property kappa ui uj. That's sort of sampling from this kappa in this randomized manner and what's the theorem is um, that again almost surely this is a dense graph sequence if this kappa is fixed and almost surely gn converges to kappa in other words if i want to write it, write it down tf of gn converges almost surely to t sub f of the kappa we started with so we're not getting a different kappa we're getting the same kappa back and you can show this i mean actually pretty easily using like concentration results like McDermott's inequality and things like that so that's sort of actually quite straightforward from uh, using probabilistic uh, off-the-shelf tools. So what's the problem statement? Um, now, the, of course, the natural question as probabilist is, well, what is the central limit theorem for dense graph limit theorem? In other words, is there a theory with which we can describe or, or sort of understand the fluctuations of random graphs? And I mean, as I said before, these objects here are random. So there's, there's randomness in there, not just in the graphs, but if you're just looking at these subgraph densities, there's randomness there as well. So is there a theory that sort of captures that? And two things I would expect from such a theory, I've written them down here. Number one, since subgraph densities characterize this convergence, all these, con in the dense regime, everything can be expressed in terms of these subgraph densities. So they capture everything that needs to be known about these limits. If that's, since that's the case, I expect that this theory also explains all these fluctuations of these subgraph densities. And moreover, there should be sort of a, a limiting Gaussian object, ideally, in uh, analogy to the classical central limit theorem. In that case, I mean, there's not just a normal distribution that we get there. We have Donska's theorem that tells us that the partial sums converge to a Brownian motion. Or if you want to switch the point of view, you could you can embed your IID random variables in the central lim limit theorem, you can embed them into the zero one interval and sort of get a sort of a, bra a white noise process on the unit interval. And then if you integrate that, you get the Browning motion. That's sort of the limiting Gaussian object that we have. So I would expect these two properties uh, to come out of, uh, of, these, of such a theory. So let's start in one place and, and see what we can do with sort of um, barehandedly. And so let's start again with this graph here. We have, I give you a kappa. Now we, we fix kappa to be constant first. So that's the addition of random case, but later we'll look at the general case. So let's think of this uh, workhorse model of dense graph limit theory uh, and focus on the case where kappa is fixed P, addition of random graph. Now, for any connected F, we can show that the correlation between the subgraph density of F and G, F and GN, and that of the edge density. So that's, that's sort of the simplest uh, subgraph density. It's just the edge density. And if you think about this, what this is, it's just the total number of edges divided by n squared. That's what this is. So it's, a, it's just really, this is just capturing the number of edges in your graph and nothing else. And if you calculate the correlation between the two, you find that that converges to one. It's a bit more complicated if f is composed of disconnected components, but in essence, the story is the same. The fluctuations, the dominating fluctuations of this object here is dominate or is determined or in essence the same as the fluctuations of the total number of edges in your graph. And well, this object we understand well, because for example, in this constant case, well, that's just a binomial distribution divided by n squared. So we know everything there is to know about this object. 
and if you scale it appropriately, we get a Gaussian limit. So, so that's that. And uh, is there sort of a, a Gaussian limit point of view? And the answer is um, yes, um, in this following way. So we could, you could, um, we could, uh, give me a second, my, my, my daughter is, uh, Okay, sorry. Um, so, yes. Yeah, so, so the answer is we can do that by um, by embed by by um, considering the following measure. So, take your kappa n, which is the one um, given by 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 this by by the graph g n, and you sort of subtract the expectation, which in this case is p. So, this gives you sort of a signed graph on, and if you scale it properly, you can interpret this as sort of a measure. On a space, what we call what I call D two. So let me quickly draw the picture. That's just this half quadrant here. So that's just D two over here. And so we can think of this as, as a measure on this assigned sort of uh, or the density of assigned measure here. And we can show that this converges to what's called a Gaussian stochastic measure, or loosely speaking, a white noise that we can call Z two here on this space D two. And um, so this sort of measure converges to, to this white noise. Now, the way to show this mathematically, since I put white noise in, in quotation marks because the, the, the term white noise has a very specific meaning, for example, in HEDA, uh, HEDA calculus, where it's sort of a, a generalized function. So I, I want to avoid that and use the, the, the appropriate term Gaussian stochastic measure to show, in order to show this, what we need to show is, well, of course, we integrate a test function against this measure and show that that converges um, to the integral when we integrate the same test function against this white noise. And, um, and so the right hand side here has a normal distribution. Um, and, and so that, that's the sort of um, result that we can, that, that we get. I mean, this specific result here is just, if you plug in phi equals one, then then this this is just a sum of the edges and that's just converging to that to the integral across the whole white noise uh, sort of field. So that's the case for kappa is constant. And what about the general case? Well, it's sort of something peculiar happens, namely the subgraph densities now are dominated not by the edge counts, but by functions of this form. So they are dominated now by um, a sum of independent random variables, which are sort of transformations of the vertex labels, okay, where the function g here depends on, on kappa and f, but ultimately they are dominated by just i ID, the sum of i d random variables. In other words, the fluctuations of subgraph counts is dominated by vertex labels, and in this case, all information about the randomness in, in edges is completely lost in the limit, at least in this case, we still had some information about it in the sense that we get this field, this white noise field on, on Z2, sort of, sort of, uh, sort of the white noise field on D2 um, that sort of expresses the edge randomness, but here we completely lose it and the, the dominating uh, effect is just the labels, which, which is not very interesting in that sense, because we're not really interested in the labels, we're interested in the edges. So of course you can start to, like, sort of ad, do ad hoc things like sort of trying to subtract the kappa that is sort of, uh, depends on the U or, or things like that. I mean, you can do ad hoc things, but but what we're looking for is sort of a coherent theory that captures more than just sort of this uh, this part. So that's not what we're going to do. Um, as I said, this sort of first approach is gives us some insights, but is not satisfying because all we're looking at really is in the constant case edge counts and in the general cup, uh, graph on case vertex labels, which is just not useful for statistics. We're not interested in the vertex labels. These labels are sort of artificial. So we're not interested in those. And um, so it turns out that the right way to, to look at this, we believe is through the lens of generalized U statistics that was introduced in uh, by Janson and Novitsky in 91 in the context of random graph. So let me quickly tell you what a, a generalized U statistic is. So it's in essentially a U statistic. You can see here, uh, that's the U statistic part. So you have IID random variables, UI, and you're, we're here with summing over ordered indices or ordered tuples of indices. 
And so you will recognize that as a U statistic, but a generalized U statistic, U statistic on top of that can also depend on um, more random variables in the sense that we can add here a random variable for each pair of these um, indices where the VIJ are just also IID, but can have a different distribution than UI. So that's, um, these are generalized U statistics. Now it turns out that the, these generalized U statistics are much richer, not only than U than um, sums of ID random variables, but they're also richer than U statistics in the sense that there are fluctuations that are sort of orthogonal to the dominating fluctuations. There are fluctuations of smaller order that are orthogonal and important as well to describe the whole, this whole object. And so what we're doing is essentially applying sort of this, this theory to the dense graph limit theory. And we sort of generalize it in, in, in some aspects that I will talk about later. And we'll complement this with uh, rates of convergence using Stein's method. So let me give you an executive summary of the results, um, sort of the high level picture. It turns out that these subgraph, I've spoken about the dominating fluctuations of these subgraph densities. It turns out that you can actually look at not just the dominating fluctuations, but you can look at fluctuations of any order because there are smaller order fluctuations with a smaller variance and they're orthogonal to them, to, uh, they're orthogonal to each other. And, um, these fluctuations are all, in essence, have, and there's a specific meaning to, in essence, determined that uh, I will talk about in a second. Um, but they are, in essence, determined by statistics of this form. Now, let me, it's a long formula, so let me uh, guide you through it. First of all, it, this is a generalized U statistics itself, in the sense that um, we are summing over these ordered uh, tuples of indices. Um, so, so this here is just, just formalizing this, this, this space of, of ordered indices. So, that, so there are n choose k um, elements in here. And the nice thing about this sum is, first of all, the summons themselves are uncorrelated. So we already can tell immediately what the correct scaling should be. It's just n choose what, 1 over square root of n choose k. That's the correct scaling because it turns out that these summons are uncorrelated. Now let's start from the back here. You can see that now, instead of looking at subgraph counts, if you will, we're looking at centered subgraph counts. That means we're taking these edge indicators. So these are the edge indicators that are one if there's an edge between I and, uh, AI and AJ and zero otherwise. And so what we need to look at is instead centered subgraph counts where the centering is not the overall expectation of that, but the expectation given UI uh, given the uh, the condition expectation, given the vertex labels, so that's the sort of thing that we have to look at. And you can see that's that's where the generalized U statistics comes into play because this is a function of these additional random variables that we allow here. In front of here, we need to allow for a certain uh, for general functions of the of the vertex labels, and we have had we've added here sort of a, a, a sort of a test function or a weight function that will help us sort of describe the white noise. Um, uh, the, the white noise field that we're getting. So this is just, just sort of, as we did before, we integrate against a test function, that'll be this, this sort of weight function. Um, so again, these statistics determine, in essence, the subgraph densities, all of them, jointly. By in essence, I mean, you can approximate, so you have these different orders of, 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 of variances in your subgraph densities, and you can approximate any of these to any degree of precision that you like with products of these statistics and linear combinations of these statistics. That's what I mean by in essence determined. But once you know these statistics, you can essentially reconstruct to any precision all, the, all of these subcraft entities. Um, well, um, as I said, these these, the summons here are uncorre uncorrelated, which is nice because they're easy, it means they're easy to scale because you know the scaling immediately. But moreover, they are also uncorrelated across different F. So if I give you two different uh, Fs, then they are going to be uncorrelated. 
What's important here, I forgot to mention, that's the most important part. We only need to do that for F connected, okay? So if, um, yes, yeah, so, so we only need to do that for F connected essentially. Um, so since we're looking at ordered, at these ordered uh, tuples here, um, even if F and F prime are isomorphic, even then they are uncorrelated because, well, how do we see this here? Well, you can see it over here. The reason that we, we are uh, normalized or centering by the conditional expectation, what's the conditional expectation of this given u? Well, it's zero because that's, that's, the condi that's the conditional expectation of that given u. So if you're taking out products, as soon as only one of these edges is, appears only, uh, appears um, alone in any of these products, the expect condition expectation is zero. That means the overall expectation is zero as well. So in order for this, for any of these terms here to, so these, uh, when you take the product here and take expectation, in order for any of these products, uh, products to be zero, uh, non-zero, you need a perfect overlap of all these edges, which you can't do if, if these um, are different because we're looking at ordered sets, okay? And especially if, I mean, if one has more edges than the other, there's even more so, there's not possible to get a product where, all, where every edge appears at least twice. And so that's why we have a lot of, uh, a lot of orthogonality here. Now, what are the Gaussian limits? So that's sort of the, I think that, that that's sort of the most interesting part of this project is sort of identify what the limits are. Let me here, um, focus first on the easier case, which does not quite fall into this Janssen, uh, Novitsky generalized U statistic um, theory, because in this case, the UI are, uh, are not independent, but we can put them on a sort of lattice of span one over N. And so we just put UI equals I over N. They're independent, non-random and particularly uh, independent, but they're not IID. And so that's sort of a case that is outside the, the general theory, but it's something we can, uh, we can still handle. Um, okay, so let, let's assume that, um, so that we don't have this vertex. So this randomness from the vertex label sort of uh, doesn't uh, disturb here. So we get a cl cleaner picture. Um, we fix an F, a connected graph on K vertices. Again, DK is this uh, half orthon, K dimensional orthon here. And then this, we can show that this test statistic or this, yeah, it's called the test statistic, converges to a integral against a white uh, noise or Gaussian stochastic measure on the space dk. Okay, um, I put the one here because that's just uh, because these are, this is not random. It's sort of you can combine it with this. So it's really um, if these are deterministic, you can sort of combine it with that. So that's why it's not really in this case. This is not important. But the test function is that, so the weight function is still there. Okay, so this converges to a normal distribution and we can express these limits, these, these, these Gaussian limits in terms of an integral over a, a white noise measure. And you can see the white noise measure lives on the sort of k-dimensional half orthant and it has an infinite, well, it, this is so-called so infinite decimal variance of, of, of the white noise. That means at the point t, um, there is a, that sort of Gaussian point has a variance that is given by this product and you can recognize it. That's just the variant, the conditional variance um, or just the variance of this product here uh, and given these values, that's just that. And you can see the measure here is not homogeneous over DK and if there's no reason why it should be homogeneous because the vertex labels are not, uh, this is not a vertex exchangeable graph and so, so the vertices are not IID. So therefore, we're not expecting a homogeneous white noise field in the sense that these infinite decimal variances change across the field. Now, what's the picture in the more general case when the UIs are IID? So that's again, that's the sort of the workhorse model um, of dense graph limit theorem. We can show now this psi function here is important because it sort of captures the randomness in these vertex labels. But again, it converges to a uh, it could, these could, things converge to a normal distribution and we can express it in terms of integrals against the white noise measure, where now we have to augment this space here. So, so this is sort of capturing, the randomness on here sort of captures the, the presence or absence of these centered subgraph, uh, subgraphs and, and this sort of captures the randomness in the 
vertex label, so we have to augment that. Now, what's interesting here to point out that this measure, this white noise is homogeneous in this DK. Okay, so if, if you if you look at the if you look at the infinitesimal variance of the white noise at T u, you can see that it is homogeneous in T. Okay, and that's what it ought to be because of vertex exchangeability. These things are vertex exchangeable, and so we expect it hope to be homogeneous. If you want to get rid of this. Uh, vertex label variance on sort of set psi equals one you sort of integrate that part out you can see that you get a homogeneous white noise on dk with uh infinite decimal variance to be the integral of this object okay so the integral of this against du which is then just a constant which is uh, homogeneous across the whole sort of field dk so that's sort of i mean there's in dense graph limiting, there's the issue of that these, these the limiting graph ones are not uh, unique because they're only unique up to measure pres to, uh, preserving transformations. And sort of this is reflected here by the fact that the fields are homogeneous, which is, means that you can apply any measure preserving transformation to this field here and you get the same in distribution. So it is invariant in that sense. Okay, so this result holds jointly for any finite collection of connected F and. Um, Moreover, these white noise fields ZF are mutually independent. And so if you think you want to think of the limit, uh, the limiting sort of the limiting object is uh, the family of these uh, white noise, white noise fields indexed by script F, which is the collection of all finite and connected graphs. If you want to talk a little bit more detail about our main uh, our main result, I mean, what is it we actually prove? Um, beyond uh, what uh, Janssen has done in his, um, in his work in the 90s. Um, so given kappa a graphon and uh, a given a sequence of connected graphs, that's just those are the graphs you're interested in. And um, each of these fi can live on a different vertex set here, or they can be the same, they can be isomorphic, it doesn't matter. And um, again, these dk's are these half orthons and um, and then for each uh, f, uh, you can give a, a different function phi i. This is sort of the weight function, and the psi i is sort of a function of these vertex labels. And uh, all we need here is that the uis are independent and taking values in zero one. Of course, this zero one space here is, is sort of arbitrary; it can be any Polish space, but but you can, without loss of generality, we can assume it's zero one. They don't have to be independent. They don't have to be IID. And um, the YIJ, they, um, what we have typically is that there are Bernoulli random variables with this uh, condition on U having this uh, sort of mean or success probability. But we can generalize our, we can be more general in the sense that all we need is that the expectation of that given U equals to kappa UIJ. But I'm sticking here to the uh, sort of graph world where YIJ is zero one. So what's the main statistic that we're looking at? We're looking to be proving a multivariate normal approximation theorem. And here's our main statistic. So these are these centered subgraphs, called the centered weighted subgraph statistics. Um, if, if these fi are big, uh, have two or more vertices and in the one vertex case, well, let me quickly go back to this here. Uh, where was it? If there is, if f is just consisting of one vertex, of course this part disappears, that's just set to one and we only have this part. So in that case, of course, we have to uh, sort of center this thing manually. Otherwise, these things already have expectation zero. In this case, we have to sort of center manually. And sort of, as you can see, this sort of captures the uh, sort of the U statistic effect, which is the dominating effect from the U statistic. It's just a sum of the, uh, so it's just functions of these uh, vertex labels. So we put them together into a vector and uh, that's the object that we want to on this uh, analyze and surprisingly when we tried that the none of the existing uh theorems at least using stein's methods works in our situation and the reason is that these things are dependent i mean that dependence within these sums not in this case this is just a sum of id random variables we've only included it because we need a joint convergence of this and a collection of these we need joint distribution individually of course this one is just a central limit theorem but in but jointly of course there is work to be done and uh, so these sums here are 
are sums of dependent random variables, but they're uncorrelated. And so that's the sort of situation that has not caught much attention in the literature. Um, so all these like standard results on, on, on local dependence, they sort of um, do not really work in the uncorrelated case where the variance is much smaller. It's usually you divide by the variance. And if the, if the neighbor, if the dependence is still there, but, but you divide now by a smaller variance, you're just not getting any convergence out of it. So we sort of have to, we had to sort of um, develop our own <clears throat> Stein approximation theorem to work in this case. We can write down the covariance structure of W pretty, pretty explicitly because they're all they're sums of uncorrelated random variables. And so if Fi and Fg are, are not equal, then that covariance is just zero. Um, if F, if I find Fj are just one single vertex, then you can just write it out. I mean, that's just, that's just uh, two lines of calculating that. And that's the same for if Fi and Fj are the same. So I mean, you, you can just get these, uh, these expressions. There's no, there's no, they're only diagonal terms when you calculate the variance. There are no, no covariances because they're all zero. Um, you can see a little bit here, um, the, it's a bit more complicated because we don't assume that they're IID. So we have to sort of, every single U uh, appears in this in here because they, they may not be IID. But you can sort of see the answer, you'll get an underlying Hilbert space structure from this. Um, so if you replace this by sort of an integral here, then you get sort of a, an inner product and that sort of, that will give us, sort of gives us the, uh, the limit, uh, the, the structure of the limiting um, white noise uh, field. And here's a sort of the, uh, the main theorem. If Z is a d-dimensional Gaussian vector with zero mean and the same covariance structure as W, then we can, um, we can bound the, what's called the convex uh, set distance uh, between the two vectors um, by C over, by constant over N to the one over P plus two. And um, where C is of course independent of N, but can depend on all, all the other things. Um, and P here in particular is the maximal size of the of the subgraphs that you're interested in. Now, what we actually do is sort of, uh, we prove a, such a theorem for smooth test functions, uh, in which case we get an optimal rate of one over square root of, what we believe to be optimal of one over square root of n, and, but they have to be really smooth. They have to be p plus two times differentiable. And when you do the, when you're interested in this sort of uh, non-smooth metric, you have to sort of, uh, inter interpolate, and that's why we lose a lot of uh, rates here. Um, but um, there's no reason to assume that this is optimal, but uh, who knows. Okay, so um, what's underlying this is a sort of an abstract approximation theorem. I don't want to go too much in this is uh, too much in the detail. This is the version d equals one. And the fact that these things are uncorrelated, the sums, the summons are uncorrelated, and therefore the variance is much smaller makes life very difficult in particular. Um, those and all those Stein theorems for exchangeable pairs, um, there's usually two terms. One is this variance of the conditional expectation of GD in terms of Stein couplings. And, um, and then we usually have an expectation of GD squared and, and that's usually the easy term. But in this case, because they're uncorrelated, this absolute value inside sort of destroys a lot of the structure. We cannot exploit the fact that these things are uncorrelated. So, so there's, this is the, the problematic one. For, for the reason that I don't fully understand, by cranking up the moments here high enough, this term, this term becomes small enough so that we can get, so that we get this conversion like one over squared of n at the cost of having like sort of in, intermediate terms. So, so this is sort of the usual, the, the, ex, the usual ex, um, exchangeable pair theorem, but on, sort of on steroids because we have now not just variance of expect, condition expectation GD, but we have to do that for all powers of D up to, uh, up to the degree that we need here. And of course, this is the univariate version. As a multivariate version is you have to have to do that for all mixed moments. And so that's what we end up with is essentially having to bound um, moments of these subgraph count statistics. Oh, sorry, centered subgraph count statistics. So let's have a quick discussion. Uh, as I said, uh, the limiting object is, um, is sort of is sort of this this collection of white noise processes living on these on these spaces here in the lattice case and in the uniform vertex label case it's we have to augment it by this thing here so that's that's that so we sort of identify the limiting objects of course now you can start to um, think about a putting these white noise processes either 
think of them as generalized functions and, and do that in sort of hit a calculus world, but which is sort of quite difficult to do. And or you can start with sort of integrate the white noise and, and, and extract some Brownian sheets out of it. And uh, that's sort of future work. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how fruitful it is because of the ordering of the vertices is still arbitrary. So if you start to integrate these white noises, you have to decide on an order. And, and, and that's usually not, not uh, the order is sort of arbitrary. So I don't know how much meaning we can attribute, you know, give to these Brownian machines. So I'm not sure how fruitful that would be. Um, but let's go and talk about statistical applications because that's sort of, uh, I hope that this theory sort of opens up a new world in how we can test um, or do statistical testing for random graphs. Um, but first, first it's important to mention, I think that this workhorse model where the, where the U's are IID, the, the vertex labels are IID uniform is problematic because it conflates the randomness of the vertex label with the edges. Usually we're only interested in the edges. We're not interested in, interested in these vertex labels. So that's sort of this model has too much randomness in it. It's just a sort of a mathematical convenient construct, but for statistical purposes, ultimately, it is not very useful. So it's probably best to think of, of the data conditionally on the vertex label. And I think that's sort of essentially the lattice model where you say, okay, UI is just I divided by N. Essentially, you order them in one way or another, whatever is convenient. What's important here is that if you want to evaluate these centered subgraph statistics, you need these values, right? So you need a priori hypothesis. Of course, you don't need the UI and the UJ. What you need is this centering value, the conditional, or what's your hypothesis, given the uh, vertices, what's your hypothesized connection probability between any two vertices? That's what you sort of need. And okay, so ultimately that's what our test statistics look like. Of course, now the weight function here, we can just set it to one because we're actually interested in an overall test across the whole network. Um, there is no reason probably why you should uh, have weighted sums. So we just put everything in front here to equals to one. So we have these ordered sums, we have this normal, uh, this scaling, and um, we have these centered uh, subgraph counts as uh, subgraph statistics, and where the, the p, i, j here are just the hypothesized edge probabilities between vertex i and vertex j. So you need to have that in order to evaluate this. And then of course, the choice that you make uh, about which subgraphs you're looking at sort of determines what overall test, what the overall test is sensitive to, right? That's sort of a choice that, that, the, that the statistician has. So let's look at a few examples. Again, the easiest one is just where you pick F to be an edge on two vertices, and that's just testing the total number of edges against the expected number of edges. That's just a, essentially a binomial test if you, if you want to think about it that way. So that's sort of the, uh, not very interesting because you're not making any use of the graph structure. So in order to get the graph structure into play, the next thing you can look at are two, what's called two stars. And there are two, three of them because we're looking at ordered statistics. That means we have to go through all of them, but they're all uncorrelated. We can just add them up and divide, divide by square root of three. And so that's sort of, that's normalizing it. It's sort of convenient. You just add them up. Uh, what, is, what does this test do? Well, it sort of tests for pairwise dependence. What is, how do you get a large positive value for this? Well, let's quickly go back. A large positive or a positive value you get if both, I mean, if you, if you look at three specific vertices um, where, where either both edges there are present or both are absent. If both are absent, we have zero here two times and you get minus times minus is plus. So that's uh, that's the way to get a large value either. So we have an increased simultaneous presence or absence of adjacent edges. Okay. It could also mean a systematic over or under specification of our connection probabilities. That could also be the case, I think. Uh, by that, I mean that if that's in some part of the graph, you have an overestimate over specification of the probabilities and in the other part, you have an under specification. Um, if there's just some, somewhere the probabilities are too large than what they should be, then you sort of, this test would sort of catch that. But if in one part it's over and in the other part it's underspecified, then sort of this, this sort of statistic will catch that as well. And what would large negative values give you, well, sort of give you sort of, an, that would mean there's a repelling effect. Is if there's an edge somewhere that sort of suppresses adjacent potential edges. Uh, and you can play the same game with sort of triangles and see that what does it mean? A large positive value means there's a lot of, 
um, sim simultaneous presence of triangles or one on and two off configurations, things like that. So just to clarify, I mean, if you brought it now to this level, we have to realize that what we're actually doing is just testing independence of a sequence of coin tosses. I mean, that's ultimately what we're doing because I could, if I go back, I mean, the graph structure comes only into play by the way we sort of set up the statistic, but these were, because now we're looking at, at it conditionally on the vertex labels, because that's what I think what, what, what we should do, then these are just independent coin tosses with the corresponding probabilities and they are not, they don't have to be uh, the same success probabilities, but they, they, they're being modeled by, by what we think are the connection probabilities. And so um, the different subgraphs essentially uh, detect different types or sensitive to different types of dependence in your sequence of coin tosses, of course, geared towards network applications. Um, there's some sensitivity towards motives. I mean, just like the, here, there are sort of motives that we're detecting, like here, three edges are on and one off, uh, one on, two off, the sort of motives or induced subgraphs. But you cannot do, you cannot say, okay, why don't we just look at motives themselves individually? You're running the same problem. Testing individual motives is the same problem in the sense that motive counts are dominated by smaller subgraph statistics and you're just turning in circles and you end up again having to analyze ultimately these centered subgraph statistics. So yes, you're looking at motives, but you're looking at sort of a weighted sum of motives and the weightage is done in the right way so that these different statistics become uncorrelated. Um, typically, you don't have these probabilities given to you, but if you sort of fit a stochastic block model um, where you assign different vertices to different communities and then you estimate within community and across community probabilities, that'll give you estimates for these PIJ. Of course, if you want to do testing, then you have to adjust the p-values because you, you have already used the data for fitting and so you have to be careful. But it's sort of, uh, you can use these statistics as sort of a sanity check whether there's any, any dependence left in, after you fitted the model that sort of, um, standing out that you should uh, be aware of. And of course, now that we have that, we can start to ask questions about what's the sparse case. And, and so I don't really have any uh, um, uh, thought too much about it, but, but I, I gather that the situation might be a little bit more complicated. Um, all right, so I think I will uh, leave it at that. Uh, 45 minutes are over and so, um, um, I want to thank you at this point. Um, the paper here is uh, where we hand, where we discuss all of that is this paper called Higher Order Fluctuations in Dense Graph, uh, Random Graph Models. It's the same title. And much of the th sort of the theoretical sort of abstract uh, theory is coming from, from these papers, and in particular this book, Garish and Hilbert Spaces. And there's one chapter on generalized Q statistics. And there's a lot of uh, abstract material in there that we have to sort of adjust, adapt to our situation. Um, Okay, thank you very much. That's that's it. Thank you on behalf of the whole audience. My applause coming. Thank you very much, Adrian. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so now we have got uh, several minutes for questions, answers. So please, maybe because the audience is relatively small, so just ask questions and see how it goes. So, Adrian, can I ask a question? Yes. You hear me? Yes, that's good. I do, um, I do. Excellent. Uh, this um, GNP thing with the uh, subgraph counts being essentially correlated strongly with the total number of edges. Yes. Um, is there any theory, useful theory, at sort of one level down if you condition on the number of edges and sort of do GNN? Or does it just destroy all the independence that you need to make things work? So you're asking about so sort of sort of answer the the, the GNM model, right? The original uh, uh, Edwards-Rennie model, where you fix the number of edges and then you look at. But I haven't thought about it. I I suspect you will you will end up with these. Well, uh, yes, I haven't thought about it, but I mean. I suspect you will end up with these two star statistics that that will be the next level of fluctuation will be these two stars. And then you sort oh, of have to, yeah. um, if you adjust by the number of edges, then if you center it, you essentially remove these the expected number of, of edges and sort of 
you ought to be morally ending up with the same sort of statistics as we do now. Because what you can do is sort of, you can condition on the, on, on the, on the edge density and then at least asymptotically all the other subgraph, centered subgraph statistics are unaffected by this conditioning because in the limit they're independent. So you would expect that in a finite end case, they are close to unaffected by this conditioning. And so these, these, these smaller, effect, smaller order effects will be the same in this GNM model. Right. They would look similar as to what we have in the GNP model. Okay, thank you. That's conjectural. I haven't thought mm, about mm, it. Mm. Okay, so maybe some other questions, please. Adrian, have you uh, have you thought about the like sparse case, the graph X's, and it seems like it's pretty similar, right? Yeah, so so I want. I mean, I had this slide, and I think so. so the multivariate normal approximation theorem should go through uh, in the sparse case as well, not in the very sparse case where the uh, where the degrees are uh, remain bounded or the expected degrees remain bounded, but where you still have this intermediate regime uh, where the uh, with the with the degrees uh, grow, but not as fast as as n, not not linearly. Um, the multivariate normal approximation remains. So I so sort of these the fields that these white noise fields that we have now they will still be there, but there may be additional uh, fields that you have to like sort of add to it to to sort of capture additional randomness. For example, the the graphics model has a random number of vertices in it. So if you, if you construct the graphics, uh, 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 a graphics random graph, the, ed, the number of vertices is random. So you have to sort of take that randomness will also come into your white noise um, fields. And so I, I sort of conjecture that's what's going to happen. Our theorem still will work more or less. It's just that whether the fluctuations of the subgraph counts can be decomposed in exactly the same way so that everything is captured by the subgraph statistics that we have now that I don't know. Um, some of it will be captured by what we have, but whether it's all of it, I don't know. For the dense graph case, everything is captured by the centered subgraph statistics. In the sparse case, that may not be the case. Yeah, I mean, the, the, it looks like the, this multivariate normal theorem you have, it just, it's quite general, right? As long as you have some yes. model where the edges are independent, uh, yes, 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 yes. That, that's, I have no doubt that the, that goes through. If you work a bit harder, because now the P sort of the probability is go to zero, so you have to work maybe a bit harder. But uh, but it, it should be go, going through morally. But again, whether this, the, the high level story is the same, I don't know. 